A state machine is a very general purpose computational idea that has a lot of application in Arduino programming. We're going to look at this in the context of a specific example, the rock, paper, scissors uh, demonstration sketch. But first, a brief digression into theory. State machines are often uh, introduced in the context of kind of a graph notation, where there are nodes, or in this case circles, that represent a state. There's a set of transitions, in this case represented by the arrows, that represent uh, some kind of idea of trans uh, moving between states. And then the transitions are frequently conditioned with rules that define when those transitions happen. And this is a very abstract notion because in, in many computational systems, the number of states is very large. It's implicitly defined by some combination of the variables. But as a general purpose idea, the, the essence remains. There's some set of numbers that describes the state of the system and fully captures the state. And then there's rules that act to decide when to move from one state to the next. And by thinking in that way, we can uh, pay more close attention to exactly where the state is in the system. So now to look at the example. Um, this example, uh, we're going to first look at the melody player, which is a, a, a state machine that has a sort of a bounded amount of code. We can see it fairly quickly. The first thing to look at is near the top, there's some global variables. This follows general Arduino programming conventions that it does use a lot of global variables. And there's four variables, basically melody, note, interval, count, and timer, that completely capture the state of the state machine that drives the melody in this particular game. So those four numbers uh, are the entirety of the description of the current status of the melody player. And then the rules will act on those numbers to decide when to take actions or when to change state. In the event loop, there's a timer that's sort of the first part of that, um, which is the combination of uh, melody count uh, being in a state of basically denoted as active versus um, inactive. And then the melody timer is, is denoting when the next uh, event should happen. When that expires, then the play next note uh, function is called. And play next note is sort of the, the guts of the state machine that can read the state values and choose how to update to apply to the, move to the next state. Let's look down then at that function first. <clears throat> so at the very bottom here, play next note. So what we see is there's basically two main clauses. If we are still playing a melody, if melody count is greater than zero, um, then it chooses a note to play. It uses melody note as the value of the next note to play. It converts that to a frequency and, and starts to tone up on the speaker. This is a side effect of a transition. There's a transitioning happen where the next a note's about to be played. There's actually literally a physical side effect in the sense that the hardware is configured to produce the sound. And then the state is advanced. The note is advanced, melody note equals melody note plus melody interval for the to choose to set the state for the next note to play. The count value is decremented to uh, decide when to end the sequence. On the final iteration through here, melody count will be zero. And in that case, melody count is set to negative one to represent basically an inactive state and the speaker is turned off so that the tone stops. That guarantees that it ends. So one thing to note is this function just falls straight through. When it's executed, it's assumed that the state is about to update, the timer's already been elapsed, and now it starts, it creates a side effect of turning on a sound or turning on silence. It changes the state variables to reflect the next state, either the inactivity or the next node in the sequence, and then it returns. And that's a kind of common pattern we'll see in these state engines where there's some set of rules that are applied to read the state, modify it, and write it back, possibly causing side effects, and then the code does not get caught in that state machine. So that's a kind of core state machine. Now I'm going to point out a state machine here, which you're not paying attention to. Well, I'm going to point out an implicit state machine. Maybe you're aware of it. The code is advancing line to line. We, we assume in these text-based programs that there's some idea that there's an order of operations where one line is executed and then the next. Behind the scenes in the hardware is a register called the program counter, which is always contains the address of the, of the currently executing instruction. And effectively, it's, it's a state variable that we don't have to think about too much that uh, tracks where we are in the program. I'll point out now that for scripted programs where you take an action and have a delay, take an action and have a delay, effectively the program counter itself is the, is the primary state variable for modeling a world. If you're taking a set of actions in sequence, the location in the program itself models something about the program's sort of idea of where it is in that sequence. So, by taking those, that idea of having a position in a sequence, instead of letting it exist in the program counter, 
we create a specific variable that we update and have rules that control the update, we are executing the same overall flow of events. We are creating a change and waiting, creating a change and waiting, but the program remains in control at all times. And the state is explicitly represented instead of implicitly represented. And that is the main point here of how we end up writing state machines. There are many different coding patterns to produce a state machine, but in, in all cases, there's some careful attention to how is the state represented. If we go back for just one second, back up to the state variables. What we'll see is uh, there's actually a lot of states. You know, note can have uh, a discrete number of values, interval can have discrete number of values, count a discrete number of values already rep to kind of dozens of states. Timer effectively could potentially have uh, uh, hundreds of values, and that multiplies times all the other to produce tens of thousands of states off the bat. The graph notation here isn't that helpful. You literally could draw many, many nodes in a graph where most of the nodes would simply be one, one duration countdown transmitting to the next one. And the point of that is to say the graph is a great way to think about a problem, and a well-written state graph can capture the essence of the state machine in a compact notation that allows reasoning about it, um, but in practice, uh, it's not always feasible to simply enumerate all the states so easily. It can be quite a, quite a challenge. The other thing to note here is one state can transition to many other possible states. With the program counter, there is a, there's less of a branching factor. Usually the program counter moves from one line to the next to the next, and an if-then, there's an explicit branch, but the number of possible outcomes is pretty bounded. Um, with the state transition, you know, you could write rules that would take any state and move them to a very large number of other states. That graph would end up being very popular with transition links, and that is easily captured in this kind of coding notation. So that's sort of a property of the state machine is it definitely allows one state to transition sort of arbitrarily to other states according to the rules. The second major state machine that's sort of clearly denoted in the program is the basic game engine. So let's look at that. The state variables for the game engine are here. There's uh, a game state uh, index. There is a counter, which is a kind of general purpose counter. Um, there's a sort of uh, record of the computer and player moves, and then another timer variable. I'll say here also, there's a few symbols defined to make the code easier to read. They use this construction called enum. Right above it is a separate construction where I simply uh, use constant ints to, to create a set of discrete values that are non-overlapping. Waiting rock, scissors, paper have values 0, 1, 2, and 3. The enum effectively does the same idea in a more compact notation. It automatically starts at 0, so the idle symbol has literally integer value 0, countdown is 1, moving is 2, computer win is 3, so on. But that allows the program to be written using a more legible notation, and yet and the code be more resistant to kind of the changes without burying sort of constants in the code that are hard to interpret and hard to update. At the end of the day, an enum statement really is defining integers here. The, the moving token literally has the value uh, uh, 0, 1, 2, um, and there's no symbolic text representation anywhere. You can't print out moving and have it come out as a string, M-O-V-I-N-G. That idea only exists at compile time, and in the final code, is just an integer. So that's a digression into ways that you represent sort of a discrete set in C, but that's actually important because those are valid, valid uh, values for the game state variable. Now to see how we use that, let's go back down into the loop and look inside the event loop to see the basic switch case that's the, uh, the game engine state machine. Switch case is a C construction where you switch on a value. Here's switch game state at line 142. And then there's a big block that opens with a curly brace. And inside that block are labels. So case and then the constant idle, which is one of our symbolic tokens, is a label that can be the rec receipt of a jump target. It's a receipt of a, of a branch. And it really is a go-to, effectively. Um, once code starts at idle, it continues down through whatever it sees. The exception is if it sees a break statement at the very bottom there, a break. Um, break then will exit the switch. That means end the current flow of execution and leave the switch. It's possible to actually fall from case to case. It's a very common error. But in this structure, I've always ended every case with a break so that only one case runs on each iteration. And that's the key here. The idea is the game state represents explicitly the kind of program counter of the game engine. Only one game state is active at a time. When every one game state is, is evaluated, one case is entered, some rules are evaluated to decide 
Should the game engine stay in the same state or should it change states? And when it changes, decide which state to change to and if there's any other side effects. So let's sort of just sort of decode a couple examples here and then and see how this works out. So to begin with, the idle state represents the state when neither servo is moving. It's the game, the state uh, when the system is reset, but in between matches. And so what we see here is there's a condition here. If user input state is not equal to waiting, basically if the user has played early, if they pushed a button when everything else is quiescent, that means they played early before the computer has played its hand of rock, paper, scissors. And so what the computer does is it tries to win. So it records the value that the user pressed in player state. It uses the win table here to look up what the winning move is for the computer. It applies both of them to hardware. This is the side effect of a transition. Computer move and player move will literally will issue commands to the servos to start to move. And then it, re it sets the value of game state to computer win, one of our symbolic tokens. And that will uh, sort of indicate now to the engine that it's in the computer win state. It resets the timer for a new interval, prints out a message, and triggers an arpeggio for the melody player. Start arpeggio was part of the melody player we didn't look at, but it configures the state variables and then issues the command of the first note. So that basically is a kind of trigger for the arpeggio state engine. It overwrites the current state, so it will actually interrupt a playing melody if one happened to be playing and begin a new state, which then proceeds kind of in the background. The melody player state engine is always evaluated in parallel with the game engine. So this, this part of the game engine can trigger a melody and then forget about it and just assume that it's continuing to play while the rest of the process unfolds. If we think about what happens then, then if the, if the player has pushed the button, we've transitioned to computer win, reset the game timer, and started the melody, moved the hobby servos. At that point, the case ends up exiting. The second clause doesn't exit and we see the break statement. So what's happened is we've changed the value of game state. So on the next cycle, that will be the block that gets entered. So switch game state entered one particular condition. It, it chose one specific game state out of a finite set. It entered that state by the case uh, branch, the label. Um, it, ev it evaluated some rules, and we looked at the one rule where the user had pressed a button. And then the result is then on the next cycle, it'll enter computer win. The other branch of the idle state was watching the timer. If the timer has elapsed, if it's gotten to be a negative value, then it's time to begin the cycle where the servos sort of indicate the beginning of the game with a one-two beat. In this case, it uh, sets the game timer to a different timing value, enters this countdown state, and then it also um, sets this auxiliary game counter to three. That's kind of a sub-state machine that will count the phases of the countdown. It's kind of one of these cases where uh, rather than have separate branch targets for the all those sub-phases of simply moving the servos out and back and out and back. Rather than encode those as separate targets, uh, this particular example uses an explicit counter variable to keep track of those subphases, and it just reduces the overall amount of code. It would, would have been possible to have countdown 0, countdown 1, countdown 2, countdown 3, each as a subphase of that sequence, but in this case it's simpler just to have a counter, and it, it keeps the code just more readable. In countdown, something similar happens. There's a check to see if the user has played early, and then there's a piece of code that is just a duplicate of the code from idle. In the other sequence, there's some logic to handle the motion, where uh, basically, based, whenever the timer elapses, that means that some phase of the animation has elapsed, then it chooses the next position to move to and updates the game, the, the game counter and the game timer to suit. Once the initial uh, countdown sequence is done, there is a, a phase in that, in that uh, branch there where once the game counter has reached less than zero, meaning that the initial warm-up motion is done, computer state is set to this pre-chosen pre value of the next random number, and the computer makes its move. So this is the moment where the computer decides whether to throw rock, paper, or scissors, and enters the moving state. And this is the most active state, because this is the window of time during which a user can produce their counter move. So during moving, uh, the sort of there's two things that happen. Once again, we're checking for whether the user has played or whether that short window of time has elapsed. We'll look first at that second case. If the game timer elapses while the server is in motion, that means the user didn't respond quickly enough, and then the system will transition to the fault state and play a different tone sequence. If the player does move, 
then the first clause will become active. And then there's some logic to handle the, the winner. There is a little, but this is exactly the moment where the computer decides already whether the player, whether it's a win, loser, draw for the player by comparing the state value that the computer previously chose with the state value that the player just chose now. And it actually begins the melody right away, even while it's still moving. It doesn't wait for the end of the motion to start the, the tone sequence and printing up the messages. So that produces several outcomes. There can be a draw state, a computer win state, or a player state, player win state. And it turns out in this code, they all have the same effect. In all three cases, uh, what has to happen is simply a little time to elapse. So here's a case where we do treat those case statements just as jump labels. For computer win, player win, draw, or fall, in all four cases, the same body of code will be entered, although the game state value will be different in each case. And that's just because the only action that gets taken in these, in these outcomes is that the, the system waits for a short time for all the serve emotions to complete, and then it transitions to the reset state. And in the reset state, uh, the servos are brought back to the home position to re-enter the idle state. And that's the very final clause in our, in our state machine where um, reset simply waits for the timer to expire, and then it goes back to the idle state. And this is, again, a very common uh, con uh, sort of code structure to see is that there's a cycle of states here. There's some branching where it can move to uh, intermediate states. It doesn't have to go to the moving state if the player plays really too early. Um, but in the end, there's a cycle where there's no terminal state where the state engine just ends up sticking. Uh, this, this particular state machine, it always ends up in reset and always goes back to idle so that the machine can play again. That's unlike some other kinds of state machines. Frequently, state machines that do parsing or interpretation will have a terminal state where the calculation or the computation is considered done, and then there's some kind of result in the state variable to, to look at. Um, in this case, it's an infinite loop. Uh, once it gets to reset, it always ends up going back to idle, and it's an infinite loop carried out in the cycle of state values. Um, it's an infinite loop in the fact that the loop ex function is executing, but the important point here is it's a conceptual inf infinite loop that is a, is a composite of all of the different decisions that get made as this whole structure is evaluated. So switch case is a common C construction. It doesn't have an exact uh, analog in Python. This would end up looking like a lot of if-then statements in, uh, in Python, if-else statements. Um, but the idea is there is an explicit representation and attention of state. The state, ver state uh, of the system is captured in a few sort of well-considered state variables. In particular, game state is an integer that can have one of a set of discrete values that represent the major phases of the game. The, the loop function is running as fast as possible, and on every iteration, it evaluates the rules to decide whether the state should change, and if so, how. And that is implemented with a switch case, where the game uh, state is used to choose one of a series of alternate bodies of code. In each body, there's a set of rules um, alternate rules that can either transition, um, or frankly, in most cases, no transition, just stay in the same state, self-transition. And then this can lead to outcomes, uh, including side effects, like hardware being updated or messages, messages being printed. And the overall effect is to create a program that executes in the, st in the space of the state indices. So hopefully this gives you some larger ideas for how to structure a program um, around a kind of set of rules that update and uh, carefully considered states.